So, hi, yeah, I'm Pat Patterson. I've been community champion at uh, StreamSets for about seven months now. Uh, before that, I was an evangelist at Salesforce, so very enterprisey, I suppose. Um, if you like, you can fuel my personality cult by following me on Twitter at MetaDaddy, um, and you can always get me uh, by email, pat at streamsets.com. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem that uh, we created StreamSets to solve, which is data drift. Um, I'm going to give you, not spend a lot of time talking about the actual product, because what I want to get onto is integration with Spark. So I'm going to be talking about uh, how we integrate with Spark today, and mostly actually what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And I actually have uh, some prototype work. One of our engineers uh, literally committed the code last night uh, for me to show to you uh, today on uh, some new Spark integration that we're doing. So if we look back at data in motion, um, what we used to be talking about were applications that were maybe writing data to relational databases, and we were using ETL tools to lift that data from a multitude of databases into an enterprise data warehouse. And from there, we could do uh, analytics with BI tools. And um, the world has changed quite profoundly since then. The uh, variety of data sources has multiplied. We're now not just talking to apps. We're talking to devices. We're taking log files from uh, web servers. You know, we, the, the web server isn't writing its data to a database for us. We're just tailing the log files. We're taking streams from uh, Kafka and other message queues. And the variety of uh, data stores, there's almost been a Cambrian explosion in the last 10 to 15 years with um, Hadoop, Cassandra, Redis. Um, it's almost impossible to name all the possible data stores, all the different places that you need to get to, uh, your data. Often we need to write into multiple data stores because they have different sweet spots. We might want to uh, write data into uh, Hive for analysis and then into Elastic for indexing. And then we have a whole range of different tools now uh, that we can use on that data, from machine learning to new uh, visualizations. And really, the problem that we solve is in ingesting that data. Okay? We, s we focus squarely on data preparation. So we're not doing analysis. We're getting the data into the data store uh, so it's nice and clean, so you can actually build um, uh, worthwhile analyses on good data. Now, when we talk about data drift, um, this is really a consequence of this multiplication of uh, data sources. Because back in the days of uh, relational databases, schemas were fairly tightly controlled. You know, we had a change process for adding a new column to the database. But now uh, things are a little uh, more loose that we can have uh, this drift, this change in the structure and semantics of data over time. So we can have structure drift where schema changes. So perhaps uh, new columns get added, new fields get added to a log file. Um, we can have semantic drift where even though the schema hasn't changed, our understanding of it does. So perhaps a US company has been storing zip codes in a particular column and it goes international and suddenly, well, that column's great for international postcodes, the, the number of characters fits in, but any downstream applications that we're expecting just digits are going to have a hard time with, uh, with any uh, uh, alphabetic characters in there. And we also have infrastructure drift, where the different upstream uh, components change over time. Applications get updated. Subtle changes occur in the data, such as um, maybe an integer goes to a float, where there isn't even um, a formal schema. You're just reading the log file and things change. And the consequence of this is that um, we have data loss. Uh, with, with real monetary um, 
effect. So this is an example that our CTO actually worked on when he was at Cloudera, I think. Um, so a system reading uh, data into Hive with IP addresses, and then suddenly IPv6 addresses start to arrive. And uh, the code was tied to uh, the uh, IPv4 addresses, and so uh, there, were just, there was just nothing in this column. And what that caused was uh, the ingest process to subtly fail. So in the best case, when things fail, you get a nice script returns minus one, and you can kind of investigate. In the worst case, you just get this silent, insidious corruption where they actually ended up um, making invalid forecasts because they weren't actually seeing all the data, because some of the records were being dropped on the floor because they had these IPv6 addresses. And it's got to the point where um, some people estimate that most or the overwhelming majority of analyst time is spent in just preparing the data and cleaning it up rather than actually analyzing it. So this is kind of like a big picture of you know a typical um, the data flow through an enterprise now. And we see um, a lot of custom code being used for ingest, as well as tools like um, Flume and Scoop. You know, this is where we're coming from. And these uh, approaches tend to rely on a fixed schema. So um, this is where this brittleness comes into the system. And this is where uh, stream sets, uh, this is why stream sets was built to address this, to give a flexible way of ingesting data so that we can uh, apply KPIs, we can have um, confidence in our data, and then our downstream analyses can actually be trusted. Um, now, where uh, a lot of you, I guess, are writing uh, Spark code, uh, you know, you've got this code level abstraction of RDDs and so on, um, Streamsets gives you a UI level abstraction. So we build pipelines in a graphical tool, just dragging uh, components onto a canvas. And we're um, contrasting with a schema driven approach, we call our approach intent driven, in that we drag in components and we address the fields that we need to manipulate. So you might address uh, IP address latitude, longitude, and so on. New fields get added to the schema, and uh, they just go along the pipeline for the ride. It doesn't break anything. Um, things change, breaking changes occur, and we don't just exit with minus one like a, a, a hand-built script might. Error records flow to uh, a specific file or a queue to be handled uh, maybe you need to update your pipeline and pump the messages through again. Something that we've uh, been working on recently is um, detecting drift and working with Hive in particular. So we can look at the schema of incoming data and say we're um, uh, analyzing uh, web traffic and we've got IP address and uh, page and method and so on. And um, we're writing into Hive. Okay, Hive has its particular schema. And then say upstream we do some GOIP conversion and add that latitude and longitude. We can detect that change and alter the Hive uh, schema in flight. So the new records arrive with latitude and longitude. We actually make that table alteration, and then we let those records flow through. And you see the hive structure evolve to match the uh, incoming data. So what does this have to do with Spark? Um, so as I mentioned, with stream sets, you can build a data pipeline in a UI level of abstraction. This gets saved as JSON. And um, you build this representation on a standalone instance. It's a Java application with a web front end. And then we can run in a standalone mode. So say you're interesting uh, web logs. You can just deploy data collector onto the different machines, 
reading the different uh, web server logs, pushing them maybe to Kafka, or you can run in the cluster. So when we run with uh, Spark on Yarn or Mesos, what we actually do is package up uh, all of our jars and uh, resources into uh, tarballs and actually do a Spark submit with our whole application and your pipeline configuration and a bootstrap class and push the whole thing up to Spark. So that means that we can leverage Spark for uh, concurrency. We can run parallel pipelines simultaneously and scale out for performance. Now, this is really neat. We can have uh, multiple uh, identical pipelines running in parallel. In the current implementation, you can have any data source you like as long as it's Kafka. Because we really, we're tied to the Kafka uh, RDD. Since Kafka seems to be becoming the, um, the message transport of choice isn't a huge limitation, but um, the nice thing is that at the end of the pipeline, you can write pretty much anywhere. So HDFS, HBase, S3, um, wherever you like. Now, and, and obviously uh, the, the concurrency here comes from Kafka partitions. However many partitions the Kafka topic has, we will spawn that many uh, instances of the pipeline and run in parallel. So this is what I really wanted to talk about because this is really cool. Uh, where we're we going with Spark. So. The first piece of work we've, we've been doing um, is looking at running pipelines on Databricks. And this is essentially um, just porting over the code that did bundle up tarballs and submit to Spark to push um, uh, artifacts into DBFS, the Databricks file system, uh, up in the cloud, and then use the REST API to start the job and monitor, monitor job state over the wire. So in this way, we can get the same uh, functionality as we have now, but running in the cloud uh, on Databricks, uh, Databricks Cloud. And that, I think, um, we will add uh, an S3 origin, because that seems to be the common case for running, uh, running on Databricks. So that's, that's just really a, a little bit of evolution of what we do now. What we're also doing, and what I'll be able to show you in a few minutes, is we've created uh, a Spark processor. So if you recall, right now we run um, a standalone mode. You, it's just a Java app. You've configured a pipeline. It's saved as JSON. It's going to run Java code to filter records out to maybe do lookups on records and write them out to some destination. Um, what one of our engineers has been working on over the past few weeks is allowing you to drop Spark code into the middle of the pipeline. So you get to define a class. We have a, a custom RDD that you, that you use, but then you can bring your Spark expertise and your Spark code and um, uh, do an implementation of a processing stage and uh, leverage the uh, parallelism that RDDs give you. Now, this goes like one step along the road or, or like a second step along the road into Spark integration in that um, really it's a kind of a shallow integration. We're running a Spark job for each batch of records that we process. So each batch is pretty much self-contained. And the kind of use cases for this might be uh, doing image classification or sentiment analysis, where there's no kind of correlation uh, across time in the data. You can look at each uh, record or each batch of records uh, individually. And it works really well. I'm, I'm quite excited to show you. Now, the big advantage of this is that we get broad connectivity. Every uh, origin that we can talk to, we can process, and you can bring your Spark code uh, to bear on. And uh, again, every destination uh, we can write to. So you could read from uh, a web service with HTTP. You could ingest Twitter and act on it uh, with uh, Spark code in Java and then write it to 
um, I don't know, S3. That's one that I've done. I've done Twitter to, to, to S3 with uh, Star Wars tweets. Um, so that's pretty exciting. We, you get to drop your code into the middle of a pipeline. And then we're going to deepen uh, the Spark integration by kind of bringing these two branches together. You know, it's almost orthogonal, you know, running on Spark and then running Spark within a pipeline. We're going to bring them together to um, run the whole container on Spark and allow you to drop your code into the middle. So this is quite a deep integration. So again, we're, we're leveraging a custom RDD. And instead of starting a Spark job for each batch as we process it, we start the Spark job for the entire pipeline kind of across time. So now you get more of the benefits of uh, Spark in being able to uh, work on RDDs um, across the whole stream of data. And you get the ability to do those iterative uh, jobs, such as training your image classification and sentiment analysis. And this is kind of like a zooming in on that last slide. So this is kind of like the, the big picture. Um, so I've just used Kafka as the, as the, as the example um, uh, data source here. But what's happening is that, um, you know, however many Kafka partitions there are, so again, like our current implementation, we would have that many instances of stream sets. And logically, the, uh, the records kind of flow through this pipeline with the the black arrows. But what's actually happening is we're integrating with um, the driver and an RDD controller to actually create our own RDDs. And really what happens at the Spark processor level is that um, there's almost like a shuffle between like the, the pipeline up to that point where there's a processor per uh, Kafka partition. Everything goes into the RDDs. And then we leave it to Spark to actually farm out the work between these processors. So we can basically have this continual um, processing going within a job. And um, this is where it kind of gets interesting. Um, Kafka is super easy because uh, it's got a deep integration with uh, Spark. And you have these partitions. It all maps very nicely. Um, in the general case, it's going to get interesting as we figure out different ways of partitioning data sources. So with, um, say, a relational database where you might have a key space, so you might have a primary key, you can look at and divide up the key space into n partitions. So I know a million records, 10 partitions of 100,000 records just based on the primary key. Um, with, say, ingesting syslog from UDP, you might configure your different sources to talk to different partitions. So there's going to be some assembly required. So we're kind of working through this idea at the moment of partitioning different, uh, different data sources. But in, in principle, most of them should be uh, amenable to parallelization like this. All right, so I have to hide behind the uh, lectern now and uh, make my sacrifice to the demo gods. So, all right, so here is stream sets. So it's this uh, GUI environment. So, you know, I get to, let's see, I get to drag stages in and I could uh, hook this up. And if I did it, my demo would break. So I'll just remove it and concentrate on what I've got already. So I'm reading uh, taxi uh, transactions, the New York City taxi transaction data set from a CSV file. Um, and then what I'm doing is I'm saying, OK, is this a credit card transaction or a cash transaction? If it's a credit card transaction, I'm actually calling some Spark code to look at the credit card number and figure out the credit card type. And what I've got here is, uh, this is so this is a general purpose holder for your uh, class. So I get to specify 
uh, the transformer class, we've called it, and give it some configuration. So this is where I'm saying, OK, uh, Visa card numbers begin with 4, MasterCard with 51 through 55, Amex, etc. So this is, my, this is my configuration for my code. I've separated that out. And then I, for it's, since it's personally identified information, I mask out all but the last four digits of the credit card. And I read it in a CSV. I'm going to write it out as JSON. And then with anything that isn't a credit card transaction, I'm just going to set a credit card type to uh, not applicable. So the really nice thing I can do in this kind of design mode, let me just reset this, make sure I get a clean run, I can uh, take a look at the data. So I can read the first 10 records from the file and just get a feel for um, what the field names are, uh, whether my uh, uh, rules are correct. So I can see here that uh, here's the data. It's coming from this is the, like the from the CSV, and I can see that the first three are card transactions. So if I look there, it has payment type of card. So I can see the first three have been switched to stream one, and then the remainder are all cash transaction. They've gone to stream two. So I can follow this along and see that there's my three card transactions, and I can see down here that this credit card type uh, field has appeared. It's been set to Visa because my code over here, um, so this is the setup. I'm passing those parameters in. I'm just creating uh, this CC types map, hash map. And then what's happening at runtime is I'm just going through this code here and saying, um, uh, go through my map and then uh, look at those prefixes. And if there's a match, then uh, I found the correct key. I can set that in the record. And then the record gets uh, returned back to the pipeline. So in that way, my code is operating on these. So the first one's Visa. Second one starts with 5-1, so it's MasterCard. And then we can follow it through, see the credit card number gets masked out, and it gets written out to a JSON file. Now, what's really neat here is if I go to Activity Monitor and do CPU, when I actually run this, so let me just reset, it's going to, I actually had to get quite a lot of data to make it last an appreciable length of time. If you watch the CPU monitor, what you should see happen is as it processes more records, um, it should go, why is it not going up to the top? It should, oh, okay, when I practice this, all four bars hit the top, but it's just, I mean, it's not even using all the horsepower on my laptop to process 50,000 records in uh, about 10 seconds. Oh, there you go. You can see they've all fallen down now. So it's actually, because I configured um, uh, four uh, threads here, it actually used all four processors in, in my laptop. But you can see here that I've actually got some errors um, because even though some records have uh, a payment type of card, the credit card number is blank and it's picked that up. Credit card is null. So my Spark processor detected that. It threw an error, put, the, put them in an error RDD. And like I said, these just don't get dropped on the floor. They get written out to... Um, uh, an error file. So I can actually go on the disk and say, uh, uh, let's see, head errors. And that's, uh, it's in a kind of JSON format, but that's all my, my error data that I could go back, uh, analyze that, and maybe um, write in a rule to say, you know, in this card or cash transaction, maybe I need to put an extra condition there to say, well, if it is card but the credit number is missing, then maybe send it along that line. Maybe even change it from card to cash, the, uh, the payment type. Oops.
Okay, so um, that's kind of like a whirlwind tour. So, kind of just a, a, a kind of a few concluding points. First is, uh, yeah, data collector brings a UI abstraction to building uh, data flows, data pipelines uh, on Spark, and this technique of um, we're actually running Spark in local mode within the stream sets JVM, but it allows us to leverage Spark code, but provide that wide uh, connectivity that we have in our existing product. And then down the line, um, lifting our container up into Spark with Spark code uh, running within it will allow us to uh, build these iterative pipelines. So some resources. Um, StreamSets Data Collector is actually open source. It's Apache 2 licensed. So you could go grab it, um, try it out, play with it. You can't get that. Uh, you can deploy to Spark right now. You can't get that little Spark processor because that's brand new. Um, since it's open source, you can uh, contribute code. We've had contributions from single line bug fixes up to a complete uh, Redis uh, implementation. And somebody just wrote a MySQL uh, change data capture um, origin. And you can get involved with our community. We're active on a Google group and on uh, Slack uh, now. So with that, I have uh, about three minutes for questions. And I'll leave the, the resources up. All right. Uh, there's a, there's a mic here. I think it works. Can you hear me? Yes. Here. I can't see where. Hello? Oh, there you are. Ah. OK. So it does work. Um, just a question uh, I didn't quite understand. In which mm. context the Spark job would run? So let's say I right. have a Cloudera cluster and with stream sets. Mm -hmm. So I consume some sources, I don't know, HDFS, whatever, or Car Kafka. Right. And then my Spark job that you showed there runs where exactly? OK. So what I showed in that little demo was not integrated with the cluster. That was running Spark in standalone local mode, just so you can leverage that Spark class. But in the, in the general case, in the existing case, um, the whole pipeline just runs uh, on Spark in the, in the cluster. So I'm kind of showing two different things, but we're going to unify them uh, down the line. Yeah, over. Uh, do you know if the um, stream sets play uh, well with Kerberos? With with what? Sorry? With Kerberos. Kerberos. Yeah. Yes, we do. Yeah, we have Kerberos implementation. Yeah. How can you turn it on? Okay, that one is that one not working? You have to press a button. Though. Oh right. So the question was, can we use it with PySmart? Py Hi, Spark. Uh, that's a good question. I haven't tried it. Um, grab one of my cards, and uh, I can I can let you know. At the back. Hey, uh, how do you compare it with NiFi exactly? Uh, that's a really good question. Okay, so clearly I have an interest to declare here, <laughs> since I'm a StreamSets employee and not a HortonWorks employee. Um, so NiFi is very file oriented, and we are very record oriented. So as you saw there, we parse that CSV at the beginning of the pipeline and pass it through memory, and then write it out as JSON at the end. My understanding of NiFi is it's file oriented. Each processing stage writes a file in a particular format. So the problem that I've seen is that if one processor emits JSON and the next one needs Avro, you have to drop a conversion in in between. And it's reading and writing to file all the time. So that's, that's the, the main point of comparison. I'll leave it to you to decide which is better. Yeah. I'm sorry. Can Oh, so the question was, can we do transformation on the fly? Yeah, this was a very simple data set. Um, what we can do is um, sometimes you can infer the data type. So with JDBC, 
you have very, you know, you, you know from the schema. Um, or you can actually put explicit type conversions in the pipeline to say this string is actually a date. So when you write it into, say, Cassandra, it gets written as the correct data type. So yes, we can do exactly that. Okay, one more at the back. Yeah, you said that um, you can uh, configure the uh, stream set that um, that way that it can like change the schema in Hive, for example, yes. auto uh, automatically. Yeah. I think that's quite dangerous. Don't you feel that it can change the schema in the way that it wasn't supposed to? Um, well, it's it's up to you to. Sorry. It's up to you to uh, configure this. So it's not uh, it's not the default, but it's a feature that's there if you choose to use it. So certainly you can write to Hive. Um, and you know, just never touch the never touch the metadata. So, if you would rather not do that, then. But we do have customers. I mean, this was driven from a customer requirement. So we do have customers doing exactly this because they have um, very uh, flexible input uh, formats, input input structure, and they need to be able to. Uh, dynamically create and uh, alter tables just as time goes by. They're ingesting data from partners, and every partner gives them a little bit different input, so they don't want to have to go and define all these schemas manually. So it depends on your use case, but I think I'm out of time. All right, well, thank you, Pat.